Hi, everyone. Welcome again to another episode of the Redirection with Terry Carell podcast. It has been such a pleasure. I'm learning so much from my amazing guests who come in every single week and they tell me a little bit about their stories, which I hope in sharing their experiences will help you kind of navigate, even though their blueprint is theirs and yours is yours. I certainly hope that there are nuggets and gems and takeaways that resonate the most with you. I'm so pleased i'm so happy so proud and privileged to welcome on board my partners this podcast is brought to you by mastercard in association with heineken zero zero of course mastercard we're always going to look for the experiences that make life more meaningful and of course with heineken zero zero they're always reminding us that now you can huge shout out to toyota jamaica because i just feel like these are the kinds of conversations that shouldn't be limited to just one particular kind of community and I just want to thank Toyota for sponsoring and helping the facilitation of sign language interpretation that is done by the great Tony Aiken. As always, thanks to Spaces for creating this beautiful space. Concepts, my official production partner for really making this podcast look and feel the way I wanted it to feel. So the question is, who is in the redirection seat? You know, like, who is Terry Carell going to speak to? I cannot wait to tell you. And by the way, if you're just meeting me for the very first time, Terry Carell is the name, and you can find me across all social media platforms at Terry Carell. You can also visit my website, terrycarell.com, to find out more about what I do when I am not interviewing amazing, amazing guests. And of course, continue the conversations even after the podcast is over by using the hashtag TKRedirection direction to Brescia, Go Shore Couriers, and of course, Beauty Brands by MDS. Thank you for also being amazing partners. So the lady who is coming up in my seat, I do not know if I have a word to describe her fully. She has no problems with starting over, starting over from scratch. She's the kind of person who's going to remind you that it is never late to start. She's going to learn how to play the piano, play the violin, do the steel pan, write the books, become the coach. And oh yeah, by the way, she's in her 70s. Say what? I cannot wait to have the beautiful, the wonderful, the vivacious, the resplendent, Patricia Reedwall in the redirection seat with me. Cannot wait. Hi, Auntie Pat. Hello, Terry Carell. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's just a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited. No, thank you. Thank you for um, agreeing to be in the redirection seat. And it's just so interesting because you are one of my most engaged members of my TK tribe. Like you are on it. You know the trends. You DM. And we're always going back and forth. Do you remember when we first met? I remember very clearly. Well, well it, tell, tell my viewers. Uh, it was in Jamaica, JMMB. Yes. I had gone to do a transaction and you had, um, you, you were there also. Mm. And uh, what I recall is that your number was higher than my number. <laughs> And you actually offered it, your number to me mm -hmm. so that I could go in front of you. And it was when you opened your mouth that I realized who you were. <laughs> I didn't, be, because you just had on normal clothes. Of course. <laughs> but, but Miss Pat, Auntie like, Pat. Like, I, 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 I feel people always assume that when they see me in the wholesale <laughs> or the meat mart, they assume, funny enough, that I'm going to be dressed. When really and truly, um, on, on any given day, I'm in jeans, um, loafers, and a shirt. But I remember meeting you. I remember you sitting down beside me. And um, I, I was raised by my grandma, Jeannie Baby. And so, and I was raised at a time when, you know, if you're in the bus and someone senior comes in, you offer the seat. Um, if you see someone senior entering a room, you open the door and you ask, my grandmother taught me this, you're to ask, may I help you? And in any way, shape or form, if you can assist, assist. And so um, it, was no, it was no problem for me for you to go ahead because I think that's what my grandmother would want me to Be do. Believe me, when you did that, you, you just 
you bowled me over. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Thank you. So let us talk about you, right? How young are you? <laughs> well, on the in another month and a half time, I will be 75 years old. A, a milestone. Three quarters of a century. But you... I think what I love about you and what I've always loved about you is that you are clearly a lover of life. And every time I see you or I hear you speak, you're learning something new, you're doing something new, you are an author. And I want us to get into those conversations because I believe, not just locally, globally, when you get to a certain age, it is retirement age. You must go, sit down, keep shut and wait. Wait until you meet your maker. And I want to know what is it about you that drives you to continuously reinvent yourself and to experiment and to try new things? Well, one of the things I will say is that I never expected to live to this age. Really? I have had six major surgeries. The last surgery I was on the operating table for almost seven and a half hours. Even me, I thought I was dead. Yeah, and you say that with a smile on your face. Um, how are you, first of all? I, I am pretty good, you know. I have the... I, there are a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. But as I tell people, I get up in the mornings, I take my medication, and I get on with the business of living. I love life. I enjoy life. And since, since I'm here yes. this long... Yes. Then I am going to squeeze every ounce of it. <laughs> out, of, out of it. You Have know? you always been this lover of life, this um, eternal optimist? Um, have you always been like this or was this something that you had to learn as you grow? Yes, I've always been like, I'm like my father. Mm -hmm. No, I'm from a household with a mother who was an Anglican, yes. a Christchurch Anglican, yes. right? Very staid and very uh, sophisticated and, and all that. And my father was an East Green Street Baptist, Baptist. Woo! Very what fiery. a combo. <laughs> very fiery and, you know, a, a lover of life and used to make a lot of jokes, yes. you know, even, even if he's making a joke about himself. Yes. So... I have taken taken my father's mm -hmm. personality. Beautiful. And, and talk to me about growing up at a time, um, and that's why I, 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 I've always enjoyed sitting at the feet of my grandmother and, and persons who have come before us because they've seen so much and they've seen so much change and they themselves have gone through so much evolution. Talk to me about Little Pat. <laughs> who was Little Pat? And what dream did you have as Little Pat? And did you ever fulfill that dream when you got older? Uh, well, Little Pat was, I, I did sports. Yes. A lot of sports at school. Uh, I went to Camperdown High yes. School. At that time, we, we were living very close. Mm -hmm. So at that time, they used to place you, you know, close to, to where, where, you live. where you were living. So I went to Camperdown High School, uh, into sports, netball, track and field, and all of that, I learned to play the piano. Beautiful. Started learning to play the piano when I was a child. And, um, you know, so it, my life was just, there was a lot of extracurricular activities. And both my parents were involved in a lot of, of you know, volunteerism and the church, church work and all that. So f from them, I learned, you know, about really not being in, in this little, little shell. Little box. Little mm -hmm. box, right, you know, spreading your, your, yourself. So my personal development was really very, very varied. Yes. And, uh, and I, I, I really enjoyed, enjoyed it. And then after I uh, got to sixth form, I went to St. Andrew High School. Oh, the St. Andrew. You have to say St. Andrew <laughs> High School. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess I didn't spend seven years there, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I, I never learned to say it. <laughs> and what was that but like? I, I, and, and it was interesting because I was able to fit into the school very, very easily. Yes. You know, with, with no problem because... Uh, 
I had so much going on for me. You know, I played and well rounded. sports. I was well-rounded and um, I did track for them. I, I remember, uh, I remember in upper six when we did, went to uh, champs, yes. girls champs. It, it was myself and Annette Smith and um, Elaine Wint. Yes. <laughs> we were the only persons who, who got points for the school <laughs> that year. <laughs> they must have been grateful to have you. Yeah, so, yes. so while you are doing, you're, you're clearly um, excelling, right? You are a well-rounder. I'm sure you were probably a student leader as well. Someone who people looked up to and respected as a student leader. What was your, your, your desire in terms of career? Because in high school now, we're getting ready to stream, do the classes that we think are going to help us to get further in our, our career. Well, I loved my parents. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, my father died when I was fifth, just turned 15. Oof. Yeah, and that was, was really, really tough, tough for me. And, um, but I loved my parents. Mm -hmm. They were wonderful parents. So I wanted to either be um, what my father was or what my mother was. Yes. The problem is that daddy was a, f a dispenser. In those days, I called them dispensers. Yes. Now it's pharmacists. Yes. And everybody that, that I met who was a dispenser were old bald men. <laughs> <laughs> so you were like, maybe. <laughs> This is not my thing. I was, I was looking and I was saying, you know, no, no, no. I don't know any, 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 any women yes. who, who were dispensers. So my mother was a teacher. Mm. And therefore, I gravitated that the... towards that. Nice. And when, when I left St. Andrew, I got a teacher's bursary and went to university, went to UA. And, um, and then I was recruited by Calabar. Really? Mm -hmm. yes. Was there a, spe a specific uh, um, subject? Oh, yes, mathematics. Woof. Mathematics is my passion. Woof. I didn't even know that. Let me, let me tell you something. All through school, if I failed everything else and you passed would. maths, I'm fine. <laughs> if I hated every other subject, the one subject I would love is, is mathematics. Math. I, I don't know. I just loved math. And tell me about dad, um, because you mentioned that dad died when you were 15 and it was tough. How were you able to grieve and mourn and still be a student and still be um, pat? And the reason why yeah. I ask is because we have so many youngsters who are experiencing death, death of um, parents, um, close family members, mm -hmm. friends, colleagues. Yeah. And I, I don't ever hear the stories of how they made it through um, high school? Well, it was, it was hard for me because um, daddy died just three months before I was to do what was then senior Cambridge. Ooh. And I know he and I were very close because I went to the Baptist church with him. Yes. And my brother, Horace, went to the Anglican, Anglican church with mommy. mommy. <laughs> so, so, you know, daddy and I were an item. And um, he got, got a couple strokes, was bedridden mm. for like um, a year, year and a half. You, you're getting up every day, you're going to school, you're coming back, you're seeing daddy. So you get accustomed to him being there. And you know, as a, a young person, you're not really thinking about mm. death. And um, one day at school, the principal came to my classroom yeah. and uh, said, that you know i had to go home mm -hmm. she had to take me home and she told me you know my father was was dying and let me tell you something when we are driving i'm holding on to that car and it's almost as if i'm pushing the car holding on to to you know just and just it was it was horrible yeah and i i went and um when we got there and we saw him pass I actually saw my father pass mm. and it was it was really very traumatic yeah and um, I remember when we were waiting on the on the funeral home to come I kept going in in the room and taking the sheet off of him and 
trying to say, Daddy. Wake up. Daddy. Yes. yes. And um, my, I just went to pieces. So I, I just be, barely went into the exams. I did nothing. And it took me a good year and a half mm -hmm. to recover, recover from my father's death. I can imagine. It really, it really did. I can imagine. And I thank you for yeah. sharing because, again, a lot of the times we, we realize that we had colleagues whose parents had passed or a parent passed and, or a sibling, and mm. they had to still come to school and they still had to sit the tests and the exams. And then you kind of wonder if they ever got the counseling that they should have gotten, um, guidance counseling, you know, therapy, which is something that we now see happening now. But, but in those, in those days, days, you had nothing like, like therapy and guidance counselors and, and all of that. Because remember now, you know, we, we're talking about this is in 1960s. Yeah. The, the early 1960s, mm -hmm. 1950s into 1960s, yeah. you see? So so talk to me about, um, so you're, you're deciding to pursue teaching, right? Yes. Education, mm -hmm. um, a love of math, and so that is what you want to do. Uh, what were some of the biggest challenges, especially um, stepping in from, from, from school to now becoming a professional um, individual? What was, what was probably the biggest challenges you could recall? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because now that I am this age and I'm looking at my life and I am honestly not seeing, not seeing challenges really? in, in, in that sense. Because what happened is that obviously my father had put everything in place. Yes. So the, the transition... Uh, my mother took me through t into adulthood and it was basically a seamless transition. Hmm. There, were, there were no financial constraints. Um, you know, I mean, we weren't rich, but there, there really were, were not uh, financial constraints. Yeah, no discomfort, right, right. or inconvenience. And, and there was no family situation. Mm -hmm. there, there was no... F the, the family was was very stable, mm -hmm. so I really consider myself to be to be very very lucky blessed. to have and blessed to have been been born into that household. Mm -hmm. I really really do. And talk really do. and talk to me about um, love. And the reason why, <laughs> and the reason why I ask is because um, I'm having conversations with my daughter now about body and body parts and you know just conversations that I certainly didn't have with my mom at the age of three to, to ten um, and you know it's something that I realized my daughter and I are talking about love and we're talking about relationships and the kinds of guys that should you know that 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 she should be speaking to and you know it, it's very interesting the dynamics and again these were not conversations that I had you always heard yes I managed to respect you but we weren't always taught to, to identify red flags. And this is me in this period of time. I don't, and I can't imagine what it might have been like in the 60s, but were you prepared for love? Well, in those days, um, mothers don't talk to their daughters about anything. I mean, you can't even mention the word sex. Correct, <laughs> correct, correct. You can't even mention the word. I, I'll give you an interesting, um, interesting incident. When I was at university, my aunt, my aunt was at the house yes. with mommy, and she is a spinster. Yes, and older than mommy. So I came down the house one day, and. Uh, I said to Ansis, she was on the van, and I said, tell me something, Ansis. Like, oh, you have not been married, and you're so old. Have you ever had sex? <laughs> I would have loved to see their expression. Well, my mother was oh. nowhere in sight when I started <laughs> the question. But by the time the word sex came out of my mouth, all I heard was, where are you going with that vulgarity? Where are you going with that vulgarity? Take it back to the university where it belongs. Wow. <laughs> that was my mother. So we were very closed off. That's so, not happening. That's not, so not how, at all. So how do you learn to but, choose? 
well, well, you just stop, uh, you just choose. <laughs> but because I, I was in the church. Yes. Because I was in the church and I was very active in church. I was playing for church and all of that. Y you know, the, 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 the gentleman yes. who became my husband was someone who I had met in, in that circle. Okay, so this is a familiar space. This is, yes. this is church, this is good space. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, um, and, you know, I actually fell in love with him. Beautiful. And I think he fell in love with me too. Beautiful. And uh, we got married. Yes. But unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, seven months into marriage, Seven. Yes, there are seven months. And, you know, when I got married, I mean, it, it, it was like, you know, the happily ever after. Of you're, the fairy you're, tale. You're thinking of, of everything. He was actually supposed to be going off to Tuskegee University to do veterinary, veterinary medicine. medicine. Right. And, um, uh, yes, so so at the time. And then, you know, there, there was this incident mm -hmm. that was just absolutely um, floored me. You have to understand, I have never seen my mother and my father have an argument except once. Yes. When mommy, daddy was teaching mommy to drive and we had gone, <laughs> we had gone on the road and mommy had done some, something crazy. Yes. And daddy asked her if she's going to mash up the car. Right. And mommy got vexed and she stopped the car and she took up her handbag and she started As walking. she should. I was told, I was told, you must never make your partner or your spouse teach, teach you to how drive. to drive. That is something I have learned and over she, the years. And she was walking and daddy started driving up beside her and saying, Maud, come on, Maud, stop the nonsense. <laughs> ha ha. My mother, you see her mouth like a rat trap. And she, Bad. she just, and she just, and eventually daddy just took us, took of us home. Of course. But that's the only time I've ever heard my, my parents mm -hmm. have a disagreement, mm -hmm. you know, not saying that they might not have had it behind closed doors. So, so when this incident, this thing, happened. incident happened, it was just a no, no. And I, I just, I left him same, same day. And you were not afraid of what, um, People would have said, I mean, imagine you get, and, and again, I'm going based off of the, the years and the gap, right? When back, and, back in those days when marriages held a very high standard, women spent a lot of time making sure that they were perfect wives and perfect mothers and homemakers. Was there ever a sense of fear as to, my goodness, what are people going to think that seven months later I have a failed marriage? Well, what I did was I basically closed off Mm. I I discussed it with no one. Mm. So so he brought in laws came to talk about it. Um, the pastor came to talk about it, and basically, if that's what you're here to talk about, I have nothing to say. To say. And I just I just closed mm -hmm. off. And then um, he had to go go off to Tuskegee, of course. So I guess that was kind of a convenient, right. convenient situation L there. Looking back, um, do you have children? No. Looking back, have you ever regretted making that decision right then and there to move fast or do you stand on it? It is, it, I stand on it, but it is something that I have um, thought thought over mm -hmm. you know a lot mm -hmm. right in the in the sense especially now that you know we have a good relationship yes 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 he, yes because he he actually apologized he good. he wrote me a letter good. and he he apologized and i you know he he has been apologetic good since since that time good and we we have a we have an excellent relationship now and he's on his third wife <laughs> Yeah, maybe you made a right decision. What? Maybe you made Antispat, maybe you made a right decision. No, but that's good. So let me get to the point where I see you wrote a book. And you wrote you wrote you have two books actually yes. that speaks about retirement. And the reason why I thought it was important to interview you is because I don't know if you ever imagined that at your prime you would become an author. So tell me about becoming an author and why this particular part of your journey was important. 
it, it is so um, interesting. I had started putting together stories of my life. Yes. And that is what, that is the book that I wanted to, to publish. Yes. I saw this um, internet income put out for an, a, a, a publishing course. Yes. So a two-day publishing workshop. So I said, okay, let me go. And then, uh, because I, you know, I, I had these stories of my life written out. And I, so I went. When I got there, the, the guy who um, was a facilitator, he said, um, if you were to write a book now, what would you just write on a topic? Mm -hmm. And then we started mapping out some chapters. So I just wrote out the joy of retirement. Yes. And started mapping out some chapters. I talked, wrote out traveling, learning to play a musical instrument, because at that time I was learning to play the violin. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're going to stick up in, because you said you used to play the piano. I played the piano. And I know organ, organ right, yes. for church. Uh -huh. At what age did you decide to learn the violin? Uh, 63. What made you just decide at 63 to learn one of the hardest instruments I think there is to learn? I went to a concert. I went to a concert and I saw this little girl playing the violin. Yes. And I said, oh my golly, the girl looks so cute. I wonder if I would look cute like that, <laughs> play the violin. And Mrs. Paulette Bellamy. Yes. You know, you know, yes, Paulette absolutely. Bellamy. Paulette was actually at the concert. So at the end of it, I went to her and I said, Mrs. Bellamy, um, I'd love to learn to play the violin because the girl looks so cute. Yes. So she kind of looked at me and sort of, you know, oh, okay. Okay, oh, well, very nice to oh, know. Call, well, call me now, kind of a thing, you know, in a very dismissive <laughs> Well, you called her. I called her. Yes, and the rest is history. How long she, did it take for you to learn? Uh, well, she, uh, I was with her for maybe about two years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually did two exams. I did the grade one Trinity College exam and got a merit. And I did the grade two Trinity College and got a merit. And at no point in time, and the reason why I'm looking at you, it's, it's admiration, it's also shock, because there's so many people who are much younger, who struggle every single day against fear, fear of failure, fear of trying new things, fear mm -hmm. of not being good at it. And here it is, you out at 63 calling people saying, you know, I want to, to play the violin. And actually in your book, uh, you told the story of you know, going on, you know, sharing your, your journey on Facebook and saying, hey, community, I'm learning to play the violin. And you, you played shaky as it was, and squeaky, like squeaky and, and squawking as, as it was. And people were not only receptive, but they were encouraging. Right. And so I guess I'm trying to ask you to help others understand, you know, how it is you were able to just not even care about what it may sound like, but to put yourself out there to learn. Uh, what, one of the things, when you are getting older, mm -hmm. you have to be prepared to be vulnerable, mm. right? Vulnerability is something that, you know, we can be at a younger age. But then after we have found ourselves being experts in our field, mm. we, we, we are afraid to take on something that may, may make us uh, less than perfect. Mm. and uh, may diminish us in the eyes of, of, of others who have held us in this high, high regard. esteem, right? So it is important as you get older, you need to be prepared to be vulnerable because one of the things also is that the people who can teach you things are younger than you. They mm. can be your, your, your children. I, I could be your grandmother, mm -hmm. right? And I have learned a lot from you. Thank you. So it is very important as you grow older, not to, not to, to, to be fearful, but drop that. And basically what you need to say to yourself, listen, I only have a few more years <laughs> on this earth, right? So let us, let us now pack in Let's milk as, it. as much. I started learning the, to play the steel pan in my 70th year. I am now a member of the Church of the Transfiguration Steel Orchestra. 
So you are just going along this road saying, I'm going to remain curious. I'm going to try new things. Um, and I'm going to find joy in learning new things. So let's go back to the book. Because you mentioned the violin and I just had to say, hold on, stick up in. But yeah. you decide that you're going to write down the joys of retirement. Right. So, so I, I did that. And that was in this workshop. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, like about a month later, I was looking for some, a document. And I bounced on the papers. And I said to myself, you know something? I started looking through it. I said, you know, I should really write a book on retirement. You know, I should write this book. And that was in March of 2016. And nine months later, so I, I, you call, birthed a I book. call that first book my baby. Your baby, you when, birthed when a book. When people asked me before if I had any children, I said no. When they asked me after that, I said yes. <laughs> and how easy or how difficult and was that process? It, it was, um, it, it was uh, difficult. In, uh, the writing wasn't, wasn't that hard. But the actual, you know, knowing what to do, how to publish and, yes. you know, making decisions as to where to go and what to do and so on was, you know, could, could, could have been a little challenging. But I, I, got, um, I got a few people who are experienced in the editorial, yes. editorial you know, to, to, to look at what I had and advise me. And How important so is that? How important is that? Um, because you alluded to it earlier. A lot of people don't want to try things because they fear that after having uh, mastered a particular craft or, or talent or possibly being leaders within an industry, no one wants to be seen as starting over in another sphere. Yeah. How important is it also to be able to drop ego and to become a student and to ask of others it is, who know more? It is extremely important. If you want to improve your life, then the best way to do it is to have people give you critical advice mm -hmm. and be prepared to take it. Mm. Because I, I remember one of the, the persons who edited my book, uh, Cherry and Smart, yes. she, she was a librarian at the university library. <laughs> yes. And then Dr. Lilith Nelson. Yes. Now, Dr. Lilith Nelson and I are coming from Sunday school at East Queen Street Baptist Church. Yes. And I gave them the manuscripts. And of course, I mean, they went to town. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you not take it personally? But, how do but, you not... How does it not bruise your ego that, you know, this thing that you're working on that you love, that you probably think is good, people are going, eh, fix this. Why is that? Write that. Fix that. Because I, I had always been somebody who, um, you know, can take advice and criticism and mm -hmm. so on. Because, you know, I've, I've done a lot of things in my life. And I have moved from, moved from one place to another. Um, for instance, I moved out of the accounting field mm -hmm. I, when I went to work in Nevis and as a regulator of the financial services, you know, which is a total, different. totally different. So I... And you did I, that after education? Yes, 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 yes. I left, um, I left teaching and I did a master's in accounting. And, and let, me, let me give you a joke. Why? What was the catalyst? Go. Okay, um, it's kind of kind of a long story. I I went to the university. I got a scholarship. I was sent by the government of Jamaica on a scholarship to the University of Wisconsin. Yes. To do a master's in educational evaluation, and while I was there, uh, the paper that I'm supposed to do, the research paper, the Ministry of Education at the time asked me to do it on a particular program. Mm. So I said, fine. I came to Jamaica, met with the PS, got everything together, and um, went back to Wisconsin uh, over there, uh, getting, uh, putting the, the first part of the paper together, the literature review yes. and everything. I did my instrument, that the survey I'm supposed to administer, and my academic advisor, and we, we all already know. 
and I called the ministry, the Pierce now in Jamaica, to say I am now ready to go and apply this instrument uh, at for the program. Mm -hmm. And can you arrange now yes. for um with 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 the the folks, uh, the principal, and so on, and um, I will know when to come down. Well, that was when he was telling me, oh, they had to scrap the program. Cheese on peas. I was, every time I hear your story about um, going to Cuba Virginia, and doing yes. and, and coming back and hearing you have to, you have to do something else, I, I, I can. Totally I relate. I can relate to it. And they told me they had to scrap the program. And I was livid. As I you should be. I was livid. I said, but how can, because I have done all of the preliminary work. So how did, how, did, how did you handle that? It's one of the number one questions I get asked when I explain my you know, whole accreditation issue. The question that I always ask is, how do you feel when you've worked so hard, you've done everything right, only to have a boof and a door go paps in your face? The decision was taken then that I was coming out of education because mm. the whole idea was that after I had done the masters, I was going to be placed in the ministry of education and I said I could not go and work in a ministry um, that you know treated treated things in in, in, in that, that way, manner in that manner so the university they they actually wanted me to use one of their programs over there but it would have meant that I would have had to start basically oh, all over. over again and I said no I just completed all of the coursework and came back to Jamaica, went to Calabar, uh, went back to Calabar and applied to do the masters in a county. I said, I'm coming out of education. Um, I'm not into, into this anymore. And uh, of course, accounting figures. Right, math, it makes sense. But here's a joke. I had never done any accounting in my life. And you decided to go into a master's? I had never done, <laughs> I had never done accounting in school, in, in, in basic school, prep school, primary school, high school, nowhere before. So Auntie Pat, and make it make sense because the math's not maths in. So how do you move from education that you want to do and the door is locked in your face to, yes, I'm great at math, but accounts is still a different type of technical knowledge. Exactly. And you decide that you are going to do a master's in accounting. What was that like? And uh, when I went to uh, apply to the university, they, they had uh, this, you could do a uh, um, preliminary, the qualifying, yes. qualifying courses and they, they they had five qualifying courses but because my first degree was in mathematics and economics and I had done econometrics right uh, so you know the econometrics is where you you, you marry uh, math mathematics and statistics right. with economic uh, policy economic uh, discipline and theory so because I had done that they evaluated my transcript and they, they decided I only had to do three subjects first year accounting final year accounting and commercial law Easy peasy, and lemon no, squeezy. No, hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second. They gave me one year to do it, one academic year to do it. I must get at least a B plus in the, in the courses. And you said okay. And, and I am doing first year accounting. And that was the first time when I went into that class. It was the first time I was hearing about debit and credit. And you basically move and from that. And finally, you're accounting at the same time. Well, I, I, I said, okay, fine. When I went into the, the lectures, I just wrote down. If you look at my, my uh, notes, notes at the time, it was like a, like a script, <laughs> like a biblical script. I just wrote, wrote down, just wrote down everything word for word. At any point in time, uh, at any point in time, did you go, what was I thinking? I must bit crazy I bit off more than I could chew and uh, no, no because because the, the the lady who taught accounting one uh, Mrs. Evadne Byfield 
she, 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 I think she worked at the Bank of Jamaica yes. or, or so. And she was just an awesome person. Lovely. I went and I explained my dilemma to her. And I said, I'm going to need somebody that I'm going to have to ask to explain certain things to me when I, when I go and, and get the notes and so on. And she was, she, she, she was very, very helpful. She was very helpful. She even came, came up sometimes before class. Beautiful. You know, a, a, a couple of, of minutes or so before class so that I could ask her certain things. And I just, I just, I you just locked it out. But I left Calabar that year. Now, Calabar is, is everybody will tell you that I miss Calabar. Miss Cal <laughs> right? But because I was involved so much in the, in the, in Calabar, you know, I was um, senior teacher, uh, acting head of the maths department, into sports, playing piano, and all that sort yes. of a thing. I decided that if I was going to do this 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 year, and um, with that sort of intensity, I could not stay at Calabar because I could not be in. The, There's no way I couldn't be in the school and not be as as involved and as so, present. So right. I actually went to Woolmer's Girls School for an academic year. Really? And all I was down there was a maths teacher. So that gave you enough time. That gave me enough time. So so I would leave there at 1.30 and get up up to Yui for my two o'clock um, two o'clock lectures, and. Uh, uh, so that that academic year, I just I just put my head double down, down and double down, and I ended up getting an A for accounting one, an A for commercial law, and a B plus for accounting three, and I was you now over delivered, and I was now accepted in the the fifteen month master's program. Look at you, and therefore you move because I mean, because you 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 move from education, and then you just mentioned oh you were head of of what an accounting service, financial services, financial services in in in, in Nevis. Nevis. In Nevis, I was in I was in um, Saint Martin first. I went to Saint Martin. I was recruited um, by Deloitte. I worked at Deloitte here, and I was recruited by Deloitte in in Saint Martin. Did you ever imagine? And did you ever imagine that little Pat who thought, well, I want to do what my mommy do and my daddy do, and I decide I'm going to do what mommy do. Would, did you ever imagine that you would be traveling and, in the, and, and working in this capacity? Well, I, I never imagined that I would be traveling for work. Ah. But my mother, because my mother, she was involved with the scouters movement yes. and, and so on. And she was always going to the scouters, scouting things, you know, in, in um, Europe and Gilwell yes. and, and in the Caribbean and, and, and so on. Because of that traveling, I, I got to understand, you know, what, what value yes. it was, traveling was. Yes. So I started traveling from, from, from early. Lovely. I started traveling from early. No, that's a redirection story and that I didn't even know of. Mm -hmm. the, the, the education to, to accounts. To accounting. That's fantastic. Right. That's actually very impressive. And it's just, it just goes to show that if you really do want to accomplish something, First yeah. of all, your, 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 your nose have to run, you have to ban your belly, and you have to decide that this is what you want, want to, to do. do. And go for it. And go, and for, go it. for it. And you can do, when I look at my life now, I, I tell everybody, I say, listen, you can do anything you want to do. Mm -hmm. Anything. Anything. Let's go back to the book. You decide to write a book in your 70s. The joy yes. of, of, of well, the, the first first I, I change the title and I call it retirement a new adventure. Yes. So basically, that book is for retirees, persons who are you know just just on the cusp of retirement. It's it's sort of encouraging them, uh, telling them that listen, there's a lot out there mm -hmm. that you can you can do. And it's very important for you to stay active and engaged. This is an adventure. And, yes. And, you know, I, I put in a lot in there about my own personal, yes. personal journey and um, the things I was doing and the things other people were, were doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, yes, we talked about volunteering, mentoring, hobbies, uh, um, the Internet. I have a whole chapter there encouraging people to go on this Internet, man. I mean, this Internet is exciting. 
fascinating and you learn so much i mean it is a, it is the, the the world's greatest university and just 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 so fascinating and then the last chapter i uh, I talked about telling your story. Yes. And the importance of us telling our stories hmm. because uh, um, other people, there is somebody out there that is We're sitting lying. down, right, waiting to hear your story. To help to, unlock. To, to make their life better. Mm -hmm. And also by telling your story, you find a lot more about yourself. I mean, I have discovered so much about myself. Yes. You see, and that is what has propelled me to really just continue, continue on this, this journey and made the journey more exciting. Absolutely. You have such an infectious uh, personality. And I guess the question that I'll, have, um, I'll ask you is, uh, because society has gotten, um, well, first of all, I think it's very desensitized when it comes to our aging community. I think we push them aside. They're no longer relevant. They're no longer anything they're not valued um and here it is you are now you are coming into spaces as a senior learning things starting things um doing things for the very first time has there ever been persons or people who have made you feel as if you do not belong here because you have had your time all right um tried to I should say, not made me. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a simple example. When I, uh, in 2017, I decided that I was going to enter the JCDC speech competition for the first time in my life. 2017? 2017. You would have been how old? I, I was 69. What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I decided I was going to enter the adult category speech. Yes. I entered. And I got a gold medal. God, God. I actually entered a poem I wrote and I won Anna Miss Lou. Those are the two poems that yes. I, I said. That poem that I wrote actually got a certificate of merit in the in the writing, creative writing in twenty ten. So I, I I presented that and Miss Lou's Mary Dry Foot Boy. Yes. And I got this um, gold medal. Yes. At the at the event there now when they were giving out, out the medals and you had a lot of children like from Mona, Mona Prep yes. and uh, schools who had also gotten their, their medals awards. Mm -hmm. and we, we took up this picture picture together and, um, and I post my picture on Facebook and this woman uh, she called me up to come to tell me, boy, so you, you're just finding your age paper. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah. You're just finding your age paper. And I was so upset. I said, let me tell you something. I said, in case you don't know, mm -hmm. JCDC has competitions for uh, right up to the adult category. Correct. And there is no age limit. Love that. Uh, there is no no maximum age limit, and uh, and I even I I got the highest mark for Kingston and Saint Andrew, cool, no, man. and I went they, I went to the national nash, to represent the parish in the national, national competition. You see, so uh, yeah yeah, and and you know it's it's just it's just so sad that people project no matter how old they are. And if they decide that they're going to sit down and do nothing or mm -hmm. that they have reserved their life to sitting down in a corner and doing nothing. In the departure well, lounge, yeah, I call the, it. The departure wait, lounge. Wait, waiting on the good Lord to, to call you. Right. <laughs> that they would see someone who now is in a different stage and phase. Getting older, yes, but still embracing the newness of new things and trying things that you were not even able to maybe when you were coming up in your professional mm -hmm. career, but saying, I can now do, you can now do many it. things and instead would project. And instead of, instead of being encouraging. encouraging. Right. And, and I'll tell you this, um, Terry Carell, this is why you see me gravitate towards guys um, your age. Yes. Right? Because, unfortunately, my... Gap. Your my, age group. Your <laughs> age group. <laughs> your generation. My cohorts, right? <laughs> Like in the, the WhatsApp group, 
and they, they are always sending out these 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 forwards and so on uh, jokes about aging mm -hmm. and about um things going south <laughs> and <laughs> you know these depressing these very depressing content content about about Asian and I'm saying to myself what is wrong with these people I don't want this what is, I don't want this I don't want this and so I when when I see I see I, I just delete them mm -hmm. I don't even read don't even read read them mm -hmm. but the, the whole point is that young people um, they, they're they're alive and they they make me it's feel exciting. alive. Yes, and I I love what you're doing and I want to do what you're doing. Thank you. So my friends, you know, the, the people I'm gravitating towards, yes, are come right down in the spectrum. Also. I, I am very conscious that when my old people die, if I if they are the only ones that I'm engaging with, what will happen to you? <laughs> what happens to your friendship, your friend network? <laughs> then, then then when they die, I will have nobody. Correct. So so guys, I'm 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 very sorry. I'm very sorry <laughs> to my, my, my older people, right? But if you want to stay there and wallow into the problems of aging, right? Then you go ahead. I have to live. Nice. Right? I the, have to the live. joys. My last two questions to you. Um, in all of the things that you have tried, you've done, I, I absolutely love it. And I know if we had more time, I would find out even more about you. And I think what has stood out to me, even though we didn't dive into the details about you having to do so much surgery, is that in spite of, mm -hmm. in spite of medical um, issues and medical conditions, you're still saying, but I have life. And as long as I have life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep on pursuing joy. What is probably one of your most priceless moments? one of your happiest moments that make you realize how this has been so meaningful to you what was that moment um i i think my my most priceless moment i think was um when i put out my second book yes right why because that book is geared towards the younger people mm. it's called retirement the journey i have a copy and the destination yes. you have a copy yes. yes yes and it is geared towards the younger people because uh, i realize that a lot of us have come into retirement totally unprepared mm -hmm. absolutely unprepared and unprepared financially um we have not taken as good Health. care of ourselves because Health. had i known that i would have had these problems i would have learned to cook i never learned to cook and was eating on the street um every day and that is what that is what has yes, shots fired I, I like guess, Yes. Why do why are you attacking me, see, Auntie Pat? And I see I see Garfine, right, <laughs> in his kitchen. And <laughs> That's right, he cooks. I yes, don't cook. Yes. But I'm, I'm working and on I, it. And I'm saying, good for you, good for you, Garfine. Because so I was always eating on on the street. And so, you know, the preservative laden, the sugar laden, the fat laden and all that. That has, has helped to to, to ruin ruin my, my health. I'm gonna do better. Right? So you need to you need to learn to learn to cook that's a beautiful price right Wait, i need to learn to cook Hi, yes, jesus yes, you need to learn to cook <laughs> redirection but, for terry carell mm. but you know um when, when when i thought of i thought of i looked at the whole thing and i said if i can get young people to start thinking about and living with intention retire, retirement and start making their plans then what what will happen is that there will be a generation of happy retirees like yourself com coming coming out yes right because they would have been fully prepared Peered. and been taking care of themselves and gotten their network together done all of the psychological things yes. um you know expanded their their scope and and uh, you know put themselves uh, in a good position financially beautiful and so now i companies call me in and i go and i do presentations Watch at, so the book so th the book has propelled me 
into this new new phase opportunities and of, space of being a retirement coach Look so i i go in i go in i do seminars with with companies and they they love it Look at I, this. The, the jta had a they had a um a, a, a one day one day spa day for their retirees and they asked me to be the keynote speaker look at that and and i i went and gave a speech and i it, love this they were for you just, they were just just everybody was just you know um in 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 awe of it so so that i think is putting out that, that second book i think is priceless because it has put me in in another gear and I, think, and I think I can say that on behalf of the TK tribe, we love this for you. We, we love the fact that you are um, embracing and getting and attracting new opportunities that bring even more joy in your life. And my final question Thank to you, you. is, um, so redirection, how would you define it through your lens, your eyes, your perspective? How do you define redirection? Uh, redirection in, in my uh, estimation is being able to or having the mindset mm -hmm. having the mindset that will will make you uh, go in another direction uh, make a roundabout turn or go turn a corner or do something you you have to have that that mindset first of all you have to have that beginner's mindset mm. that you can start again right beginner's mindset is very very important because if 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 you didn't have that beginner's mindset when you got got uh, had that that those issues there it would have knocked you down correct and i i would have been been knocked down also you see, so you have to have that beginner's mindset. You have to have a courageous mindset yes. also because you have to be, you know, in a position where you, you say, look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure it out. And I'm going to figure this out and I'm, I'm going gonna to move. I'm going to, if I need to turn the corner, I'm going to turn the corner. If I need to turn around, I'm going to turn around. Whatever I need to do in order to live mm -hmm. to really live that's redirection thank you auntie pat thank you very much you're one of the persons who i look at in the space who has shown me the importance of living authentically and not being afraid to try and to to love doing and discovering self even beyond retirement age in fact if you don't want to retire if i don't want to retire that's that's my business as well, and that's my choice. So I thank you for reminding me that it's never too late to start. It's never too late to start over. And most importantly, it is important for us to continue living even after society might dictate that it's, it's over. Well, let me tell you my definition of retirement. Retiring means... You take off the old tires, put on new tires, and hit the road again. Listen here. Auntie Pat, thank you so very much. I mean, from pianos to organs to just learning the violin and just learning the steel pan and writing books and now a retirement coach and just doing it all and showing us that, listen, it's never too late if you guys enjoy this episode let us know drop it in the comments drop it in the chat like subscribe uh, we'd love to hear from you and if there's anything that resonated the most with you we would love to hear from you certainly hope that you enjoyed this episode and we we look forward to having you and to seeing you next week take care Thanks to our partners, Mastercard, Heineken 00, Toyota Jamaica, Spaces, Commercial Concepts, Breche, Beauty Brands by MDS, and Go Shore Courier.